Hello, I'm Piers Shepherd, Senior Researcher at the Family Education Trust. And today we're going to be discussing the subject of home education. And I'm going to be speaking with a leading home educating veteran, Randall Hardy. Now, home education has become a very big topic in the news due to coronavirus and the resultant closing of schools. Many parents are having to home educate their children for the first time. Others, however, have adopted home education as a way of life. And for a number of years, there've been moves to bring about mandatory registration and monitoring of all home educated children. So um, I'm going to be speaking with home educating veteran Randall Hardy, who is a vocal opponent of these plans uh, for mandatory registration and he's involved in several initiatives which seek to protect the freedom of parents to educate their own children in the way they deem most suitable for them. And he believes it's very important that everyone understands why this natural and historic responsibility is under threat. So, Randall, um, many of our readers and watchers will already be home educators. However, for, for many others, um, home education may be something quite novel. What would you say are the principal reasons that parents decide to home educate? Hi, Piers. Thanks for asking me to do this with you. My answer to your question would be that the first pioneer of the modern form of home education in England was Joy Baker a Norfolk mother of five back in the 1950s. She believed that all parents should have the right to determine how their children are educated and by whom. And as you've already mentioned, my view is that that it was based on the natural and historic responsibility of parents. Following on from her, there were a few pioneers of elective home education across the UK from the 1960s onwards. The majority of these were motivated by the, their philosophical or religious convictions. Their positions, com, position continues to be protected by human right treat, rights treaties. For instance, Article 2, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights reads, the state shall respect the right of the parents to ensure such education and teaching is in conformity with their own religious and philosophical convictions. In recent years, the reason why parents choose to teach their own children have become far more varied. A recent local government association report commented, in a large majority of cases, this was because the parent felt that either their child's special needs, ed special education needs, or their children's mental health needs were not being met. Now, there were some problems with the sample size of parents approached in that report, but a larger survey by, par by the parents group Define Fine carried out last year observed the overarching reason for re deregistrating a child was to prioritize their mental health and well-being. In other parts of the world, there are other reasons. For instance, I've been told that in the United States, concerns over gun crime is now a major factor. Well, that's really um, interesting. Um, now, in April 2019, the government produced new guidance for local authorities in England on elective home education. What would you say are the positives and negatives in this guidance? And is there anything in it that we should be particularly wary of? Yeah, besides recognising the primacy of parents in ensuring a child receives a suitable education, the one good point in it was that the government said there was no need to change the law in England in regard to monitoring home educated children. However, that said, the implication was that local authorities already have all the powers they need through their legislation in regard to their safeguarding responsibilities. 
the subtle change resulting from this new emphasis was a move away from the previously recognised position that a council should only make inquiries if there were concerns that a child was not receiving suitable education. That has been turned on its head by section 4.2 of the guidance for the local authorities, which at one point reads, until a local authority is satisfied that a home educated child is receiving a suitable full-time education, then a child being educated at home is potentially in scope of this duty. British law famous, is famously based on the principle that citizens are innocent until proven guilty. This clause has inverted the basis of educational law by making clear that a local authority should act as if home educating parents are guilty of failing to pr provide their children with a suitable education until they have proved themselves innocent to a local authority officer who may or may not be biased against home education. This change has resulted in a situation in Portsmouth where the council has in recent months issued 137 section 437 notices, notice to satisfy letters to home educating families. According to the Portsmouth Home Education Group, this is over half the families known to the council. Parents in the area have taken legal advice from a QC and recently begun legal action against the city council. The wider home educating community is keeping a close watch on the response because in the new guidance, after reminding the local authorities of their public responsibility as prosecutors, the Department for Education added, the department will be happy to support local authorities to test the boundaries of case law through discussion with them of the potentially difficult, difficult home educating cases, which they are contemplating bringing before their courts. Section 6.22. So there's obviously there's a lot of um, things that people are trying to do to regulate home education. What would you say are the leading threats to home education and where are they coming from? Historically, throughout Britain, it's been overzealous council staff in the moulds of those Joey Baker struggled with against for eight years before she prevailed. But in the last 20 years, there's been a noticeable shift in the nature of the threat. In England, the shift from local prejudice to a national campaign to change the foundations of education law was signaled by Ed Balls in 2009, who, as Secretary of State for Children, Schools and Families, asked Graham Badman to review home education. The intention was to change public opinion by raising fears of home education being used as cover for child abuse. After that attempt failed, there was something of a lull, but opponents of educational freedom began to undermine it once again by generating an unevidenced hostile environment. Then in 2017, Labour peer, Lord Soley's private member's bill opened the door to a deluge of negative comments in Parliament and the media, which resulted in the revised guidance, which is now causing problems in Portsmouth and elsewhere. In Scotland, the approach was different. I expect many Family Education Trust supporters are aware of the failed named person scheme. Among those who joined together to oppose this through the courts were Scottish home educators who understood the unexplained dangers in what was sold to the public as benevolent policy to safeguard children. In a 2016 High Court judgment on the case, Lady Hale observed, the first thing that a totalitarian regime tries to do is to get at the children, to distance them from the subversive, varied influence of their families and indoctrinate them in their ruler's world view, view of the world. In my opinion, all parents, not just home educators, 
need to seriously consider whether or not we are witnessing leaders around the world, not just in the UK, seeking to do that very thing without being honest with their electorates. The threats are widespread at present, with Wales and the Isle of Man having experienced more aggressive initiatives than those in England, though both these have now been shelved for the time being. In Europe, people may have heard that in October, President Macron decided to justify banning home education unless there are medical or health reasons by saying that it was being used by Islamics, Islamists against the values of the Republic. His speech made clear what he sees as the purpose of schools. Schools should first and foremost instill the value of the Republic, he said in the speech. This echoes a statement from a 2019 speech by Ofsted's Chief Inspector at the Wellington Festival of Education. There, Amanda Spielman explained, the founders of the common school movement in the United States in the 19th century wanted to mould fine upstanding citizens of the Republic. Seems to me that home education is considered by some as a threat to their grand project. And consequently, there is an international move to discredit it in the minds of the general public everywhere. Right, well, um, now I don't know if whether you think that the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Child has played any role in facilitating attacks on home education. Now, before you answer this, the, um, most people I think have heard of the UN Declaration, but a lot of people don't realize that it's been ratified by every country apart from the United States. And much of the opposition to ratification in the United States um, came from home educating organizations who felt that it posed a threat to families. Now, would you, uh, would you say that this declaration has played a role in facilitating attacks on home education? And would you um, sympathize with the view of those home educating parents in the United States who believe that this posed a, a great threat to, to um, the freedom of families? The more I research this area, the more it seems that the question raised by those organisations and parents in the United States are looking in the right direction, but perhaps not deeply enough. Recently, UNICEF UK submitted a response to last autumn's House of Commons Education Committee's inquiry into home education. In their in introduction, they described themselves as mandated by the UN General Assembly to uphold the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and promote the rights and well-being of every child. Now, to me, that suggests that they consider themselves as some type of international police force charged with ensuring that nations conform to the requirements of the UNCRC. The tone of their submission, and I would encourage your supporters to read it for themselves, doesn't challenge that view of themselves. For instance, praising both Germany and Sweden where home education is only allowed in exceptional circumstances they suggest this is the very position the Department for Education should be moving towards in England. It is interesting to me that this is the same outcome which President Macron said in October he wanted France to adopt. However, that said, I want to encourage people to dig deeper than just the UNCRC because UNICEF is sister to UNESCO which takes the lead role in the UN's global education program. I recently looked at the mission and mandate page on its website. At the top, 
is this statement, which incidentally is the first clause of its constitution. Since wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men and women that the defences of peace must be constructed. When I read it, it struck me this was not a statement of fact, but one of philosoph philosophical belief. That is confirmed in a 2018 article also found on UNESCO's website. Citing Julian Uxley, its first director general, article author Mark Goodale draws on Huxley's 1946 test, text, UNESCO, its purpose and its philosophy, describing it as a blueprint for the new organization. According to Goodale, Huxley charged UNESCO with overseeing the emergence of what he described as a single world culture with its own philosophy and background of ideas. Huxley's words are strong throughout his booklet. And on page 13, he asserted, specifically in its educational program, it being UNESCO, can stress the ultimate need for world political unity and familiarize all people with the implications of the transfer of full sovereignty from separate nations to a world organization. To me, that is an idea which future generations should be encouraged to debate vigorously rather than embrace uncritically. One final point. Recently, UNESCO published its Global Education Monitoring Report entitled Inclusion and Education, All Means All. I have not read the previous ones, but I've been told this is the first time these annual reports have referred to home education in any way. A statement on page 188 reads, Homeschooling is an example of how parental preference for self-segregation can test the limits of inclusive education, despite the potential that distance on and online mainstream education offer for inclusion. Seems to me the problem that organizations like UNESCO and UNICEF have with home educators is that they cannot be confident that parents will teach their children to embrace the ph philosophical ideals of men like Huxley and their utopian dreams of a world at peace with itself. To put it simply, those within these organizations believe that they need to rescue tomorrow's citizens from the influence of their parents and then force state-dominated schooling is their method of choice. Well, well that's all um, very disturbing stuff. Um, do you think that the current situation where, you know, now many parents have suddenly been forced to supervise school at home because of the coronavirus uh, crisis, do you think that this situation could lead to more parents electing to home educate in the future? I'm glad to use the phrase school at home. What the majority of parents have found themselves doing over the last year is trying to deliver a school curriculum at home with absolutely no preparation. Many of them have found the experience very, very difficult. However, reports are that a significant number have found having their children at home really beneficial. I've seen social media exchanges where parents are saying their children have rediscovered a love of learning and that relationships within the family have also benefited. One group, the Scottish Home Education Forum, surveyed people who turned to them for advice in the first lockdown. And just under half of those who responded said that they planned to home educate to when schools returned. One parent commented, I've applied to home ed my 10 year old. It's something I've wanted to do for her for years. And the situation just gave me the push I needed. 
Another commented, lockdown gave me an insight into how much school was negatively affecting my son and what he was capable of at home. Wow, well, that's very interesting. And um, we're coming to the end here, but um, uh, would you say, is there, if there was one website you could recommend where people can keep up with what's happening in the UK in regards to home education, would there be any particular website that you, you would recommend? There's lots of good ed websites in the various different countries of the UK which offer advice to parents who want to home educate. The one which does cover the whole of the UK is called the HE Byte. And the URL is he uk, And that has links to all the other, um, or most of the other websites. And it also provides a running commentary of what's happening politically in across the UK and he even carries stories from other places like South Africa and France, which I've already mentioned. Great. Well, that's really interesting. And um, if people want to access that website, it's the he uh, hyphen byte b y t e dot uk. Correct. Well, Randall, it's been uh, really informative and um, interesting interview. There, there's so much um, that you've said, which I didn't know, and I'm sure that uh, may, it'll be re many of our readers, uh, this will be very new to them as well. So um, thank you very much. Um, and um, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pierce.